Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome wherever you are to today's webinar. Thanks for joining us. Special thanks to the London Climate Action Week and to E3G, the hosts of the Action Week, for their terrific support. I'm Adrian Lovett, CEO of Development Initiatives, and I'll be moderating today's discussion on what is an increasingly urgent issue. Let me take you back for a moment to 1992 in Rio de Janeiro, where 154 countries signed the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, and agreed to work together to stabilise greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere and prevent dangerous human impacts on the climate. An annual conference of the parties, a COP, was established to track and drive progress to implement the convention. By the time we reached COP15 in Copenhagen in 2009, developed countries agreed to provide 100 billion US dollars in climate finance to developing countries each year. They failed to reach that target until 2022, 30 years after the convention was signed in Rio. And in the meantime, as if we needed a reminder, the impacts of climate change have been clear with 2023, the hottest year on record. And yet there's still no common definition of climate finance, leading to inconsistent reporting, a lack of faith in the headline numbers, and a loss of trust by developing countries. Pretty much everyone agrees that the $100 billion a year is nowhere near enough, and a report by the independent high-level expert group on climate finance, led by Vera Songwe and Nick Stern, identified the need for not billions, but trillions more. So now, as the next COP looms, COP29, in the Azerbaijan capital of Baku, the UNFCCC plans to adopt a new target with a new set of letters to describe it, the new collective quantified goal on climate finance, the NCQG. And that means that not only does the total size of the target matter, the issue of what should count towards that target and how that should be decided is of the utmost importance. I'm delighted to be joined today by an excellent panel, my colleague at Development Initiatives, Ewan Ritchie, our Senior Development Finance Policy Advisor, and the author of a new report released today titled Climate Finance, Earning Trust Through Consistent Reporting, which we'll hear more about shortly. Ilari Aragon, Climate Justice Policy Lead at Christian Aid. Sandra Guzman Luna, the founder of Climate Finance Group for Latin America and the Caribbean. Sunil Acharya, Asia Regional Policy and Campaigns Coordinator for Oxfam. And Colin McQuiston, Head of Climate and Resilience at Practical Action. I'm going to ask each of our guests to share, to share some initial thoughts and we'll then have time for some questions. So as you're listening, uh, please do add your question uh, by adding them to the Q&A box through the Zoom link. The questions will be visible to our panellists and we will do our best to answer all those we can uh, once we've got through the initial comments. Um, and those that we do answer will then be visible to the audience as well. We're recording this event too, as you probably heard just a moment ago, and a recording will be made available on our website in due course. So let's get underway. And I'd love to start, uh, Ilari, first with you, if I may. You lead climate justice policy for Christian Aid, um, and in your previous role with IIED, you were right at the heart of the COP negotiations, which I know you're still very close to, providing technical advice to the least developed countries group. You bring your training as a lawyer, as well as your experience working with indigenous communities in your home country of Peru. I know you're speaking from London today, but given all of that experience, can you give us your assessment of the state of play at the moment in these discussions around the NCQG? Yes, thank you, Adrian. Um, I, can, I can probably mention five points. Um, so the NCQG for me, it really is a unique process in climate finance because it really places the needs and priorities of developing countries at the center of discussions. But then the question is, how much do we really know about these needs and priorities? Um, so I, I guess a first reference point is really to look at what NDCs say and, and more specifically about the costed actions that countries include in these NDCs in these documents, which basically talk about the climate actions they will do domestically. There was a first report, which is very important, produced by the Standing Committee on Finance, the, um, the Needs Determination Report. And this was done in 2021, so uh, a few years ago. But this report basically looked at all NDCs at, back then, and it resulted, it concluded um, an aggregate estimate, um, basically of how much indices will cost to implement collectively. And he concluded that it adds up to 
8 to 5.9 trillion up to 2030 cumulatively. So that's a reference point in terms of, in terms of how much we know um, about needs and priorities from what countries themselves have put forward in NDCs. Very key point, and this is something for people to watch out, a second N NDR report is going to come up in October or maybe September this year, and this second iteration is going to be an updated version, is going to present very important new estimates of NDCs costing. So that will be informative and it will be important in terms of shaping the quantum of the NCQG to be agreed later this year at COP. Um, a second consideration for me is that um, although the NCQG, it really is about defining a new target that will replace the 100 billion, for me, it's not just about a target. It is also about the quality of climate finance. So it, it has to be a dollar figure. Yes, of course, it has to be a quantified target. But um, but then issues to do with the quality of climate finance also need to be at the forefront of discussions. And since I began uh, participating in this in this NCQG meetings, negotiations that started in 2022, I have heard many developing countries saying many times that really climate finance cannot really exacerbate current debit, the levels of debt burden that a lot of climate finance has been uh, channeled, has been deployed through um, debt generating instruments like loans and sometimes even loans at commercial rates. And that is no longer tolerable because obviously uh, debt burden means that countries have less money, less finances available to deal with other national development priorities. Key message emanating from almost every single NCQG meeting I've been on is that the NCQG cannot exacerbate that burden in developing countries anymore. And in that context, uh, quantity matter, but quality of climate finance matters too. Quality of climate finance is also about balance. And I think it is important to learn from lessons of the 100 billion here. So we have seen that the disparity of support, if you compare support to mitigation versus adaptation. So quality of climate finance means also ensuring that this new target can ensure that more support is, is given to other area of climate actions like adaptation, like loss and damage and others, and not just to mitigation or not the majority should really be to mitigation. It's about balance. Um, it is also about deploying the right instruments, the right financial instruments for the for the different types of climate action. We have learned about the significance of grants, so non-repayable instruments, and these are vital for areas of climate action that don't generate revenue, like adaptation and loss and damage. So grants going forward should really increase, and they should be prioritized for this kind of areas of climate action that cannot really re generate um, revenue. And, and critically, when, it, when we talk about quality climate finance, we need to talk about transparency and, and we need to talk about the fact that climate finance needs to be more credible uh, from now onwards. So what exactly counts as climate finance and how to counter these are issues that come up in every single NCQG discussion, and I, I, I've been in almost all of them. So as you rightly said, <laughs> you know, there is no universally agreed definition on climate finance, uh, nor a common modality or guidelines to account climate finance under the UNFCCC. And what we have at the moment is really uh, different reporting practices by donor countries, which demonstrate a different understanding of what they consider climate finance to be and what they report as climate finance. And you might have seen, you know, the Reuters report last year, you know, they, they find that a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, money reported as climate finance is, is really going about, you know, funding, funding to support projects to do with coal plants, hotels, chocolate shops and export expansions and things like that. So, I'm sure some of that has got elements of climate there, but really the significance of it is probably not as much. So in conclusion, really, I think there is a, there is a crisis of trust 
Some people have even said that this is really the wild west of primate finance, that really without definitions and common accounting methodologies, everyone is just counting different things. And it's really hard to see where progress really is, frankly. So to ask, the, to respond to the questions, have we met the $100 billion? Well, some people might say, frankly, it depends on what report you look at. I mean, the OECD report might tell you something because they use a specific accounting method. But if you look at a shadow report produced by Oxfam, they will come up with a different estimate that, that will be lower because they use a different methodology for accounting based on different parameters. I'm not gonna get into technicalities, but basically we're talking about a lot less climate finance in real value. So the climate finance issue is really at the core of the NCQG discussion and it is a problematic aspect. Um, I personally don't think that it is a lot, it is about investing a lot of political energy um, in getting into in getting into like one sentence right or one paragraph that, that says this is climate finance and let's all agree on this because that practically is politically just very difficult and we, we all know that it has been tried before it, it just can't be done and especially now in the context of the NCPG negotiations there's only like six months left so I agree with one colleague that said in a side event it, it is it is more it is really about defining climate finance by defining the NCQG with much more granularity so it's not about even a list of like activities that can be counted at climate finance, like a typology. I mean, there isn't really time for that exercise. And frankly, there isn't really political appetite, but it is really about defining climate finance by defining the NCQG better. And to be more concrete, to explain what I mean by this, uh, some countries in NCQG negotiations, and I've, I've just heard this at the last meetings, uh, I'm not pushing to start a discussion about what, what climate finance is and let's arrive at a definition, but what, what, what they are doing, what they are pushing for, is at least to agree what climate finance is not. And that is an approach. <clears throat> so they say loans at market rates cannot be counted at climate finance under the NCQG, like not anymore, <laughs> noting that only concessional loans at a grant equivalent value can be counted, can be considered. Export credits as instruments cannot be counted. And official development assistance should not be counted. Government finance should be on top. So these are some initial approximations that we, we will see more ideas, I'm sure, coming up. But this is this is some some these are some approximations that I have, I have heard uh, in, in recent NCPG meetings in June. Great. Fourth point, um, contributor base. Uh, who is responsible for delivering the goal? And this is a very contentious issue um, that has really come up a lot and it's really getting things a little bit stuck. So th there are two clear camps here on this issue. Developed countries, uh, on one hand, they really want to see an expansion of the contributor base. They're not really comfortable with this division of Annex 1 and Annex 1 countries. They really argue that the world has changed since 1992 when this was created, that the ability to contribute and the responsibility of some countries I think they mean China, both states, has actually evolved and they should really come in and contribute after all the high emitters, high GDP countries. Uh, but the tricky thing, and this is very political and very, very difficult, is that they're, they're really linking the contributor base issue to the quantum. So in, in other words, basically the scale of the world, the quantum will be determined by how large the contributor base is. And that is difficult to define and decide in a technical setting. I think it's a political question maybe for ministers to deal with and untangle if possible. It's difficult. On the other hand, developing countries rightly so argue, look, this is not a problem that we created. This is your problem. The Paris Agreement language is very clear on this. It really talks about and it's one countries, developing countries taking the lead. These sort of arguments are really a distraction and, and really divert the discussion. There isn't really time for that. Let's get down to business. So, yeah, this is this is an issue that is, is proving quite difficult. And finally, one final point is about well, um, let's maybe get some numbers going. I mean, finally, this is really about agreeing um, on a target. And we we don't really have um, a lot of propositions on this just yet. Um, I've heard during the la latest NCQG meetings in the bond meeting in June, um, the Arab group, LNDC, 
other countries have talked about 1.1, 1.3 trillion per year. Um, that's that's one figure that has been popping about. Um, and uh, however, uh, developed countries have not really said anything about a quantum, uh, nothing. Uh, they, they have been very reticent to really provide any sort of idea, proposition of estimates, because like I said, they really are waiting for this issue of contributor base to, to get a bit of a bit more shape and, 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 any other, and some other issues as well. But I'm going to just leave this um, here with, with these five points. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ilari. That's a terrific uh, uh, overview to get us started here. And I know a lot of those themes are going to be picked up from from other comments but your your framing of this as a, a crisis of trust um and in a crisis such as that uh there is the the hunger isn't there the need for uh some common ground including around facts around around data around information and you've pointed us to both the need for clarity around quantity um and moving towards the numbers as you were just talking about there but also around the qualitative aspects of, uh, of what this new goal should look like, including those aspects of transparency that you talked about. And uh, what if, if we can't say what does count as climate finance, we can perhaps say what does not count. Now, on that point, I want to turn to uh, to Ewan, um, Ewan Ritchie, who is uh, my colleague at Development Initiatives, previously worked at the Centre for Global Development. And Ewan, you also worked in the National Statistics Offices of both Nigeria and the UK. Um, now, your your report uh, released today explores the problems with current climate finance reporting and sets out practical steps that providers can take to help build a more trusted and transparent climate finance system. And yeah, I know you report you interviewed uh, for this report many officials, some of whom we uh, know are part of this conversation today, um, and civil society organisations too, working to deliver effective climate finance. So, give us, if you could, an overview of the report's findings and the key recommendations. I think they're going to go right to the topics that that Ilari has has uh, got us up and running with on this conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, thanks. So, so yeah, as you say, this paper that we're launching today is, is about consistency in climate finance reporting and how that can be improved. Uh, so it, it, it's a product of an in-depth look at both the data the countries provide on climate finance, uh, but also a number of rich conversations with officials about how that data is produced. And that's because we really want the recommendations to be feasible, uh, both technically and politically. And, and, and as uh, Larry alluded to a few times, uh, you, you know, th th that's quite a binding constraint um, in, in this space. Um, so this report starts by asking uh, why we want to measure climate finance in the first place um, and discusses three kind of core things for which it might be useful. Um, so the first is that we want to see how provision of climate finance has changed over time. So have all of these international agreements, such as the 100 billion goal uh, and the NCQG, you know, are they actually leading to greater provision um, and to what extent? But to answer this question accurately, you need to have a consistent measure of climate finance across time, and that's something that we know we don't have. So uh, it's not just that some countries have explicitly changed how they measure it, such as the UK recently. Uh, we also know that the share of project funding counted as climate finance today is much higher than it was in the past, even for very similar projects. Uh, and in addition, you know, nearly half of the projects back in 2009 weren't even assessed for their climate focus. And obviously many of those would be included. So, um, so when the US said in, in, a, in a submission to the Standing Committee on Finance back in 2022, that uh, we are spending 89 billion more, uh, that was a 2021 figure, in the climate finance than we otherwise would have been, um, I'd have to respectfully disagree with that, with that submission. These reporting changes mean that we don't really have any idea um, uh, how much climate finance has increased since the goal was agreed. Um, and that's obviously really important because goals like the 100 billion goal or the NCQG are surely intended to spur greater action rather than just spur countries to go on a hunt for existing projects that, that might be relevant. Um, so the second purpose that we might want to use climate finance numbers for is to assess which countries are providing more of it. Um, there have been sort of many attempts to estimate the fair shares of climate finance provision from CGD, ODI, and, and, and WR as well, um, and probably others, um, based on the amount the country should provide, you know, based on things like historical emissions or GNI per capita. But to make those comparisons meaningful, again, measurement has to be a consistent across countries, um, and we know that's not the case. So 
Uh, some countries, for example, have counted donations of excess COVID vaccinations as adaptation finance, whereas most haven't. Some countries count aid to Ukraine's energy sector as having a principal mitigation focus, uh, whereas other countries didn't count such investments at all. Uh, and so these are just kind of a few differences, um, uh, a few examples, but these differences in reporting are widespread. Um, and so those who watched the recent NCQG debates at Bonn may have seen the, the Chinese delegation specifically mention France and a few other countries as those that have met their fair share. But these direct comparisons are kind of misleading. While France might be one of the largest providers, it's also um, among the least concessional, with only about 5% being granted, I think, uh, and also the most uh, one of the most controversial in terms of what's included. Um, so the third thing is that we, uh, you know, we might want to use the climate finance numbers to track how we are performing against estimates of need. Um, you know, that's obviously the key thing that we're, we're interested in, as Ilari was talking about. But again, it's measured so flexibly that we can't be sure that uh, much of what is being counted is actually relevant to the needs stated by developing countries in their national adaptation plans or, or, or NDCs. Uh, so one thing that will be really interesting, uh, as well as the second NDR report coming out, is the the, the, the the biannual transparency reports from developing countries under the Enhanced Transparency Framework uh, that are supposed to contain estimates of climate finance needs uh, needed and received. And I think there might be some significant differences between those numbers and, uh, and the ones that are currently reported. Um, so that's a diagnosis of the problem. Uh, lack of consistency means that climate finance statistics are not really that useful for any of the things that we might want to, uh, to use them for. And, you know, one way of fixing that might be to agree in a detailed definition of climate finance. But you know, we've we've heard sort of time and time again that um, that, that as Larry said, there's sort of not really the the political appetite to do that, and and some countries have ruled that out specifically, uh, at least under current circumstances. So, you know, while that might be something to aim for, uh, this report is concerned with recommendations that can push us in a direct in a direction of greater consistency. Uh, but you know, for now, in the absence of of such definition. Uh, so I'll just talk about a few of those, um, but, you know, please do read the report and would be really interested to hear, hear your thoughts. Um, so the first is that we, you know, we outlined some specific asks around transparency, and one of those is on impact. So understanding more about what projects are aiming to achieve is important for understanding why they're counted. Um, and so countries really should be required to report on what impact climate finance projects are supposed to have. Uh, in a standardized way where possible. And, and so these are these are um you know assessments that should be happening as part of project appraisals. And so you know there's no reason why um why this should be impossible and, and some countries do something similar already. Uh, and it also obviously speaks to the quality uh, question, which is obviously really important. Um countries also should be required to provide links to project documentation, at least for projects um, above a certain size. So the ETF already requires this to the extent possible. Um, but there's a reason um, that we've heard, though, it couldn't be mandatory for projects over a certain threshold, for example, uh, 25 million, which would mean at the most tens of projects per year for, for each country, but it would account for the, the majority of, of climate finance. Um, uh, Mike, Connection said it was unstable, so just check and you can all still hear me. Yep, you're, you're holding yeah, fantastic. it. Fantastic. Keep going. Great, thanks. Um, so that, um, what, another thing we talk about is that the need for the existing peer review process under the UNFCCC to be extended to include a review of the quality of climate finance reporting. It shouldn't necessarily be up to um, uh, articles like the Reuters article, excellent though it was, to, to, to be doing this assessment. So there is a current review process, and it but it kind of assesses parties' narrow compliance with transparency requirements, um, but it doesn't probe why certain projects are included and, and, and what the rationale is. Um, and similar processes in the OECD do seem to have been somewhat effective in harmonizing reporting in, in other contexts. Um, we also advocate for using novel methods such as machine learning methods to monitor reporting both within and across providers. So, so we argue that these aren't just sort of the latest fads, but they hold promise for addressing the very real capacity constraints that some countries face by automating some of their quality assurance processes. Um, and in addition, it can be used to create common benchmarks um, across providers in ways that we discuss in the paper. Um, and the extent to which countries deviate from those benchmarks uh, you know, could be something that, that review teams evaluate um, that will be useful information. So this isn't um, you know, uh, using these methods to replace human judgment, but just enhancing it and stretching it further. 
um, and I'm conscious of time. So just one one final thing I'll mention is that the the, the CMA, the uh, conference of the parties serving as a meeting of the Paris, Paris agreements, I think I got that right, um, should be providing guidelines for counting the climate share of project funding on a project by project basis. So lots of countries use the real markers to measure climate finance, despite the well-documented problems with that system and the fact that it was never intended to be quantitative, basically because it was there, um, you know, because there were existing guidelines for doing so. And the fact that there's nothing similar for more for a more granular project by project approach, which many see as more preferable, it is part of a reason that that's not been adopted. And so it would be easy to build on existing approaches such as uh, you know, in UK and US, for example, um, to, to, to kind of develop some guidelines there. Um, so these are just a few of the things that we uh, discussed. They're all quite wonky and, and they're all, yes, quite modest in, in the scale of ambition. Uh, uh, but, you, you know, hopefully these are things that could move us towards greater consistency. So, um, yeah, really interested to hear, hear feedback from anyone. Thank you, Ewan. Report, um, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Great. Um, lots to chew on there and people can see the report that's been put in the chat um, and dig into that. Some great charts and uh, further points in there for people to look at. And uh, happy to hear questions for any of the panellists uh, on what you and or Alari have already said. Uh, do put your question uh, in via the Q&A uh, and we will try and answer those questions when we get to having heard everybody on the panel. Um, so to continue, um, let's turn to Sandra Guzman Luna. Sandra, uh, you are uh, you, well. You have a deep knowledge of these issues in the Latin America and the Caribbean region, specifically as well as globally. You were formerly general director of climate change policies in the Ministry of Environment in Mexico, um, and since then you've founded and you now lead the Climate Finance Group for Latin America and the Caribbean. So perhaps you can give us a bit of an insight into that region. To what extent is current climate finance actually reaching where it's most needed? And how do you see these issues? Thank you so much, Adrian and colleagues. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope you can hear me good. Well, I just would like to start with that, with a reflection and, and agree with my colleagues. For many, many, many years, we were focused on the on the quantity side of the of the climate finance, like asking, we know we need more money, we need more money, and it's part of the discussions that we have been having internationally. But after many years, we realized that it's not only about the quantity, but it's about the quality. To what extent this climate finance is reducing emissions? To what extent is reducing vulnerability in countries? And to what extent this finance is really connected to needs and priorities? And that's why what Ilari was mentioning about the NCQG or this new goal is so critical because we have now to, to really turn a, our, our view towards how much is needed, but particularly where is needed. And in the context of, of Latin America, um, it's, it's something that we have been analyzing for, for, for many years. And we identified that um, in Latin America, of course, it's not only about uh, this balance between mitigation and adaptation, because as you know, um, uh, around the world, 80% of the of the finance goes to mitigation. No? Mitigation was like the center of many discussions. And But now that you see the progress of climate change, and if you read the NDCs, if you read the national adaptation plans, a big part of the needs are now in adaptation. However, the adaptation flows are not growing at the, at the speed that we need. So uh, for many years, we have been tracking what are these needs, uh, for instance, in Latin America. And just to give you a couple of, 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 of numbers, uh, we, we analyze not only how much uh, these countries are receiving from international cooperation related to climate change, but also we are analyzing how much are our countries receiving for, from carbon intensive activities, not what, what type of incentives they have to, to, to pollute, to say. And we also analyze to what extent uh, Latin American countries are mainstreaming climate change in their budgets, not to what extent they are also contributing uh, with climate finance, public climate finance to deal with climate change versus uh, carbon intensive activities. So what we observe is that, for instance, uh, in Latin America, or, or the 20 major emitters in Latin America receive 50 times more money from carbon intensive activities, such as exportation of oil, than from sustainable income or sustainable finance like the Green Climate Fund or the Adaptation Fund. So the amount of money that our countries are doing or are making it polluting is, is, is higher. So the incentives, uh, the incentives to continue this production of fossil fuels is, is huge. And if you see the, the, the budget uh, expenditures, you will see more or less the same dynamic. 
like in Latin America, these 20 major emitters invest 31 times more in exploitation of, of coal or, or, or fossil fuel um, resources than in, in, in climate policies. So, but what is the problem? That we are not necessarily putting this a connection between needs and the climate finance in an accurate way. And that's why uh, I would like to emphasize that at the international level, we have to, to differentiate two key elements of the Paris Agreement. In the Paris Agreement, we have Article 9 that is related to the provision from developed countries to developing countries to achieve those transitions. And then you have Article 21C. And Article 21C calls to everyone, all the countries, to make all the financial flows consistent with a, with a low carbon development and, and climate resilient uh, development. So why I'm trying to differentiate this, because in Bonn, for instance, we had a conversation about this, these two elements. In one side, it's true that Latin American and African and all developing countries need resources to decouple their economies from carbon intensive activities. So that uh, transition uh, finance will be critical. And that has to be part of Article 9. And that's why one of the conversations related to the new goal, uh, uh, and, and, and there is this debate between where the new the NCQG sits. It's Article 9 or Article 21C. And according to developing countries, the, the new goal, the new collective goal should be sitting in Article 9 because it's a commitment from developed to developing countries to support the reduction of emissions and the the reduction of, of vulnerability. And, and this is important because it's the only goal, and, and I would like to emphasize this many times, it's the only goal that um, will help developing countries to, for instance, access to concessional and, and non-mainly um, grants, because there are financial flows that will continue flowing. Let's say, yeah, it's true, more and more of climate finance from private sector and others are, are, are increasing. But what type of finance is is this? Is is accessible? Is predictable? Or to what extent these finance that is mobilizing, for instance, through multilateral development banks, to what extent these are really reacting or responding to the needs? And, and what we see is that no, they are not responding to needs because a lot of this money that is out there is not accessible. Not everyone can access to these financial mechanisms. That's why the NCQG for many of us has to deal with all of those elements that the rest of the financial system is not dealing. So that's why for many of us the NCQG has to have at the core of the of the of the of the goal public finance, mainly in form of grants, mainly concessional, mainly for adaptation because it's where the major needs are, and has to avoid this continuing in terms of growing the, the depth of, of developing countries. Then once we have that very well set and designed, the NCQG can help countries to continue this pathway. And then you have Article 21C. And Article 21C is a process where every single country has to participate in a way. So that's why, um, so once you have the NCQG well framed, then you have to continue with 21C, which means that Latin American countries, African countries, Asian countries, European countries, everyone has to start also dealing what needs to be changed at the national level. And I can tell you, I'm from Mexico, and I would like my country to decouple the economy from carbon intensive activities, from fossil fuels. To uh, In Mexico, for instance, 35% of our income comes from fossil fuels, for the exportation of fossil fuels. So we have deeply, uh, we are, and our, our economy is deeply embedded in fossil fuels uh, dependency. So in order to cut that dependency, we need investments to achieve those energy transition uh, towards more renewable energy towards a, a less uh, pollutant activities and and we will need that investment no to to then accelerate and eventually change and transform our public uh, finance system and this is where every single country has to let's say to to aspire like we all have to to really work in the transformation of the public finance systems at the national level but developing countries ha need also that incentive like from con from developed to developing countries uh, because it's part of the responsibilities and it's part of the needs to really accelerate because we have to to say we have to recognize that every developing country is different we cannot put every single country in the same pot um, because the needs and and the and the priorities are different and if the if climate change do not respond to those priorities in in a, in that uh, considering that differences then we never going to achieve a successful climate finance um, 
allocation, no? Like we really have to take into account these things and priorities. And that's why the NCQG is so critical because it has to take it into, into account the needs and priorities. And, and, and it's the only goal that we will have to, to, to really ensure, it's the only goal that we will be able to track. And that's very important in terms of transparency. So I will leave it there and very happy to continue the conversation. Thank you so much, Sandra. You really underlined for us how uh, private finance and the wider financial system are really indivisible. And as you say, some of the challenges around the NCQG are the extent to which it has to fix or address problems or challenges in the wider system. So thank you for really bringing that uh, to life for us. Um, let's turn to Sunil, um, Sunil Acharya, who joins us uh, from Kathmandu. Uh, welcome, Sunil. You coordinate Oxfam's regional policy and campaigns in Asia at the intersection of climate and inequality. Oxfam's work has already been cited once or twice in this conversation, and particularly relevant here is your recent report called Unaccountable Ad Adaptation that I think looks at the Asia Development, Development Bank's claims on climate finance. So tell us, how is current climate finance uh, working or not working for developing countries and, and frontline communities in Asia? Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, let me start with the fact uh, that there are several problems with climate finance, uh, at least from the perspective of Asia, that have remained consistent uh, despite inconsistency in reporting climate finance by the providers over years. And some of these have been mentioned. For example, uh, the finance provided is nowhere near the needs of the people and communities facing the climate crisis. Uh, initially, in um, the climate negotiations, when uh, the UNFCCC convention was agreed, uh, you know, there were was talks at the scale of millions. Then when the, uh, the, uh, in Copenhagen, uh, the developed countries agreed to provide 100 billion per year starting 2020, uh, the billion uh, was thought to be too big. But now, if you look at the realities on the ground, you know, the needs are in the tune of multiple of trillions, but what we've been, you know, uh, delivered is tiny. The second consistent problem we've seen is the re-leveling of the existing development aid. Uh, this has again been mentioned already. So, for example, uh, the money going to earthquake reconstruction here in Nepal, where I'm based, was also counted as climate finance by the providers. There are several examples of those. Uh, the third problem we see is the uh, fact that it is extremely difficult to access. It is not reaching where it is needed and the local needs are not accounted for. The fourth, the, uh, you know, the majority of the client finance that is provided is loans, which should not be at the first place be counted as client finance. And this is putting huge burden on developing countries, especially in Asia. Uh, the countries, uh, here in Asia are having to pay 16 times more in debt servicing than, uh, you know, they are able to, uh, you know, allocate for uh, climate change adaptation. And then, uh, yeah, the, the, the other problem is the lack of balance uh, between finance for addressing the impacts and then uh, the finance that is allocated for reducing greenhouse gases, supposedly uh, addressing um, mitigation. Uh, we, we don't still uh, you know, see any money being, you know, delivered for dealing with loss and damage. So uh, putting this into some of the numbers here in Asia, so, uh, you know, we did one report in 2022, which showed that uh, the countries have costed, uh, we, we did it for 18 countries who provided numbers. Uh, it shows that 1.3 trillion is needed every year until uh, 2030, but what is being provided is an average of 14 billion per year. And that is also at the face value. Uh, out of which it's just one third goes to adaptation. And uh, as I mentioned, majority of it is in loans. Uh, only 12% comes in the form of grants. And then the most important critical aspect is that uh, we found that you know only about 1% of that finance can be termed as locally led. Now, let me come to uh, the recent uh, report on the Asian Development Bank we uh, published. Uh, on accountable adaptation, the Asian Development Bank's uh, overstated claims on adaptation finance. Uh, the reason we looked into um, the Asian Development Bank is uh, because uh, this is one of the principal multilateral uh, banks providing climate 
finance in the region. Uh, they have committed to provide 100 billion uh, in climate finance from 2019 to 2030. And what it found uh, was their reporting of climate finance is very problematic. There are several issues, but let me highlight four of them here. The first is their commitments versus the actual uh, allocations. Uh, we see that you know they have been reporting increases in uh, you know what they term is climate finance. What they say is they are providing uh, in climate finance, but what we found was uh, you know only about uh, an average of six. Uh, 0.2 billion has been allocated uh, of, of, uh, from uh, 2019 to 2023 uh, to meet uh, their own targets. They will have to increase this average to 11.5 billion per year. And if you look into the adaptation finance numbers, they will have to increase uh, their allocations from 2.1 billion to 3.9 billion through to 2030. Uh, the major uh, issue is uh, the uh, you know uh, the their allocations of adaptation finance in loans. Only six percent of the provided uh, you know finance uh, from 2019 to 2013 is in grants terms, whereas uh, the the yeah majority more than 93 percent is provided as loans. So that is the critical issue we see. The other uh, issue, which is extremely worrying, is the overreporting. Uh, we looked into some of their largest uh, climate change adaptation projects, and we found that they are potentially overreporting to the tune of 44%. Uh, we counted the, the total reported finance to be 1.7 billion, but our calculations showed that you know, those could be only about 0 0.9 billion. The other um, you know, uh, side of the problem is uh, we uh, said that uh, most of the finance is loans. We tried to calculate the grant equivalent value, which provides the more uh, accurate measure of the present value of finance uh, to the recipient countries uh, than the face value. And then that 1.7 billion, uh, which they reported to have been provided as adaptation finance comes down to only 0 0.3 billion. Look at how, you know, the recipient countries are having to pay, uh, for example, for uh, the climate crisis they didn't cause in the first place, um, uh, but they are having to pay again to deal with uh, the, the, the problems they are facing, which is a double injustice. Then uh, if we also looked into the, uh, the sectoral and geographical allocations. When it comes uh, to the Asian Development Bank's uh, finance being mobilized, we see that it's been prioritized for you know, upper middle income countries um, uh, and not to the countries uh, who are most vulnerable to the climate crisis, such as the small island developing states and the LDCs. Uh, they do favor mostly on infrastructure projects um, uh, and ignore the socioeconomic vulnerabilities. For example, um, our findings show that about 20% uh, of climate adaptation finance goes to transportation. Um, and 17% of that goes to uh, urban infrastructure type of projects. The more worrying part of their climate finance is the fact that there's a huge gap in terms of you know, what uh, it is addressing, what impacts it is addressing. For example, uh, the SN development uh, climate adaptation projects tend to overlook deeper engagement with the gender specific needs and uh, vulnerabilities uh, that has been exacerbated by climate crisis, and these projects lack an intersectional approach. There is a consistent top-down approach uh, in terms of uh, engaging local stakeholders and uh, you know, seeking inputs into the decision-making. Uh, that means the locally laid principles uh, of um, you know, adaptations have been ignored, and then the projects frequently fail to conduct uh, comprehensive analysis of the inter uh, interaction between the poverty and vulnerability. So these are uh, some of the you know um, problems we see are not only limited to the SN Development Bank, but also uh, you know if you look into the other uh, providers, uh, both multilateral and bilateral. So what we are recommending, uh, to be very brief, is that there is an urgent need to enhance the accuracy of reporting, which is the central theme of this webinar. Uh, and how that could be done is through improving the methodologies for estimating and categorizing the climate finance budgets uh, uh, 
the, you know, included in the, uh, the, the projects uh, that come in the name of climate finance. And then uh, there's a critical need to report the grant equivalence at the project level to clearly show the value for the recipient countries and the public um, on how much you know uh, they are receiving rather than uh, you know the the face value and then uh, there is an urgent need um, particularly for the multilateral um, you know providers to introduce a concessionality system to differentiate between the concessional and non-concessional loans uh, because most of the you know loans are non-concessional or market rate loans and then uh, so there's an urgent need to increase the amount of grants uh, to be provided. Uh, the projects, uh, you know, uh, should undergo the thorough gender analysis, the uh, the underlying uh, causes of vulnerabilities, um, uh, and uh, the uh, the need for involving the local stakeholders and communities to uh, for, for decision making. Uh, and finally, uh, the uh, providers need to commit to the transparency uh, so that you know stakeholders can you know uh, put them to account. Because uh, at current is uh, it has been you know highlighted, uh, the providers have been reporting their finance in their own terms, and it is extremely difficult uh, to you know pinpoint on a specific. Despite uh, you know um, organizations like ours, uh, Oxfam has been consistently been uh, you know analyzing what they count versus what is what could be termed as climate finance uh, right. i will stop it here but very happy to uh, you know uh, uh, yeah uh, interact with the questions so, thank so. you thank you very much Janelle. great you've given us a great uh, insight there and a deep dive into that particular context and and the and the research there around the asian development bank really interesting to see the issues coming from that i want to bring in our final panel member colin um, who is uh, with us from Practical Action, um, Colin McQuiston, Head of Climate and Resilience there, and as well as working extensively on sustainable development and disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation in Asia, Africa and Latin America. You've also been deeply immersed in the UNFCCC COP process and associated negations, ne negotiations since uh, 2014, I think. Now, given that you're based in the UK, you're not the only one on the panel based in the UK, um, but we are speaking during London Climate Action Week. You're actually not in London, you're in Daventry, I think, which um, is one of those places in, in England, for those who don't know it, that sort of pretty much decides the political temperature of the country. And we are just over a week away from the general election in the United Kingdom, elections in all sorts of places around the world this year. Uh, but in terms of global climate finance contributions, can you just give us a sense of the UK context, uh, perhaps tell us what a, sh a fair share for the UK might look like. Uh, and that might help us understand a little bit, if you can tell us as well, about what the challenges are in calculating a fair share for, for any country. Thank, thanks, Adrian. And it's it's uh, so good to be here and to follow uh, four ex five excellent presentations so far. Um, I, I think um, the key that I'm picking up is um, the climate climate change, the climate emergency is a critical global challenge. And we are allocating resources, but they're they're not they're not going where they need to go and they're not need, they're not going at the scale that they need to go to. So this issue around scrutiny is central. Um, and I think the critical thing about the scrutiny issue is you know climate climate change is not the only emergency out there. We've got the biodiversity emergency, we've got poverty, we've got um, bad governance. And therefore, you know, having an ability to uh, differentiate between climate finance dedicated to tackling the climate emergency versus finance that is um, for tackling those other problems is central. And I'm not advocating for a um, not for mainstreaming climate in those projects and those project issues within the climate finance, but we need we need to be able to um, account for the efforts that's being applied to make sure that we are delivering on what we need to deliver. Um, so health, health problems, governance problems, biodiversity problems, they all have a climate dimension, but we shouldn't be confusing climate finance and official development assistance. Uh, and I think the UK has a key role to play here because we have been traditionally uh, a leader in 
artificial development assistance. We've been a leader in contributions to uh, the glo global development more generally. Uh, and I think over the last few years, we've seen that leadership eroding uh, and we're seeing the consequences of that, I think, in the failure of the negotiations. So let me just talk about a few issues around climate finance more broadly uh, and then just dip my toe into the um, the forthcoming election and, and why that can play such a, such a critical role. Um, I think the first thing to really, you know, reiterate is that climate finance is not official development assistance. Climate finance is finance to mitigate, it's to adapt, and it's now to uh, address loss and damage, uh, which was something that wasn't uh, prevalent in, in the early 90s when the negotiations first started. Um, you know, irreversible and unavoided impacts of the climate emergency were not at the forefront of people's mind in 1992, but they are now. And we therefore need to recognize that, you know, the, the landscape in which climate finance is operating has changed. Um, I think another important thing around the, uh, you know, the landscape that has changed is the scale of the emergency has, has gone up. And um, you know, climate finance in, in 94, mitigation, adaptation, yes, quite rightly, but we've already heard from, from Sinla and several speakers that the level of investment going into adaptation has always been inadequate or, or has been second best to the mitigation. Whereas wouldn't investment finance, traditional commercial finance actually work in many of the mitigation cases, particularly where we're doing business as usual shifts from dirty polluting uh, fossil fuel based energy systems to renewable energy, which has got you know, that, that value addition and that return on investment. So that brings me into, I think, the, the next issue, which is, you know, it's going to help if we've got clarity around what climate finance is, because we recognize that private sector finance has a role to play. Now, I agree with what most of my colleagues have said is that it shouldn't be part of the climate finance um, uh, contribution, that we need to have that clarity, particularly around the issue of, of Article 9 that, um, that, that was raised by, by Sandra. But, but basically, you know, there are many uh, mitigation investments where there is a return on investment and they shouldn't be swallowing up the climate finance that can then go to those uh, essential areas such as adaptation and loss and damage where it's more needed. Um, I agree with the point raised, you know, the, the scale has gone up. So we, we need to have clarity on, on what climate finance is so that we know how much of the effort we're making towards that one to 1 1.3 trillion that was estimated as the, uh, the need, you know, the needs determination report. But the reality is probably uh, a significant um, quantum above that. And it's certainly not um, as in Bonn a couple of weeks ago, climate negotiations, it's certainly not a, a 1 billion addition to the 100 billion. That's the floor from where we start. We need an aspirational target, not a floor from where we're, from where we're starting. So, you know, the election is coming up uh, and quality in climate finance is key. So I think, you know, whatever um, colour the, uh, the, the new government uh, reflects, it's really an opportunity for UK leadership in this area. To, to resurrect the, a position that the UK has traditionally held uh, and to work with the critical uh, partners, the European Union and the other developed countries to really start to step up and meet the needs of this climate emergency. We saw that happen in, in 2020 with the COVID emergency. We saw the mobilization of resources at scale in the billions overnight. Um, why can't we see that happen for, for climate change funding? Um, at the SB60 a couple of weeks ago in, in Bonn, progress was bogged down in red lines. It was bogged down. We were unable to make progress on the technical issues because we didn't have clarity on the political direction that is needed. Therefore, the election next week is an opportunity to bring in a government that can really um, honestly uh, tackle the climate emergency, but also provide that much needed global leadership that will help us move forward. Thank you. Thanks very much, Colin. Really uh, interesting and thought-provoking stuff. Uh, you picked up just before you mentioned uh, the UK at the end, uh, or as you, as you mentioned the UK, you, you, you talked about Bonn, where I know a number of you, I think most of you, uh, were uh, just in the last few days as, uh, as part of, of, of that 
long road to Baku um, and the need to do the, the pre-work to get uh, some of these arguments into some sort of shape in, in time for uh, the COP uh, later this year. I, I might just do a quick, as we, as, as we go into uh, wider questions, just a quick uh, score from each of you out of 10 on uh, how confident are you at this stage that we're on track for a successful COP in Azerbaijan based on the experience of, of Bonn or anything else? Just really top of your head, marks out of 10. What's the sense, uh, Ilari? Uh, Ilari, you're, you're on mute. Go on. Um I'm so sorry, Adrian. Can you please repeat the question? I'm sorry. I, yeah, I missed the connection. No, I'm just I'm curious to hear just a very quick score out of ten for how confident each of you are that, based on the discussions in Bonn and elsewhere, that we're on track for a successful outcome on these issues at, at COP in in Baku later this year. Marks out of ten. Wow. Well, I mean, the quantum is is a very tricky thing, and the contributor base is a very um, sticking point. So I think it will depend on what ministers can do before COP. Mm -hmm. They will meet to talk about issues before COP, and hopefully they will untangle some issues. But really, I don't know if I have to score it. Oh, maybe, I don't know, a seven? <laughs> okay, seven, right. Yeah, me medium optimism. Ewan, what would you say? What's your number? Um, yeah, it's a great question, and I think maybe it depends a little bit on 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 what counts as a success. Um, yep. Got a feeling. Uh, I'm not, yeah. yeah, I think you know, in terms of something that you know recognizes the scale uh, and you know ensures that it's sort of uh, you know not just relabeling existing things and and um, you, you know recognizes even challenges and and all of these things. I, I'm not not very optimistic. Um, uh but yeah i mean you know some compromise that moves us uh yeah maybe seven for some compromise that gets us going now but um I, I mean the other thing is i, I mean <laughs> now uh, you yeah now you uh, six i'll go for six go. but six. I, maybe it depends a little bit on the us election as well which is you know we're sort of talking about the uk elections but i think um obviously <laughs> <laughs> what what happens for climate and the rest of the world, you know, is, is going to be severely impacted by uh, which way that goes. So number yeah. of very, not only the US election, perhaps the the French uh, uh, the French election, which is just uh, a week or two away as well. Uh, Sandra, what's your number out of ten? Go on, just give me a number. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I was also thinking like, well, depends uh, because there are several issues, but I, I will score in function of the NCQG. I would say um, I was in between five and six <laughs> and, nice. and I will say 5.5 uh, five. and <laughs> just a quick comment. Uh, it's because, yeah, we have to think also in it, this, every single COP has something to deliver, right? Yeah. Uh, this is not like the, the main COP where all the issues will be solved we already have the Paris agreement this is a cop where and actually that's we we call it the finance year because this year will be critical for finance and uh, but there are several things happening around the world in in terms of elections in terms of the so now we are also discussing the 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 financial reform at the in the multilateral development banks and others so we every time that we see a cop we have to think in all the underlying conditions that are in order to get there but I would say 5.5, .5, there are elements. <laughs> right. All the elements that we need for yep. the, a, a good SQG are they? Uh, the matter is how to push in different political scenarios like G20, G7 and others. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you for introducing the the one decimal place as well. I'll, I'll allow that. Uh, so, Neil, what would be your number? What's your confidence for, for Baku at this stage? Yeah, from what you've seen in Bonn, uh, things are extremely disappointing. Um, uh, and also, you know, to point to the fact that uh, the the cops have, uh, you know, always uh, come up with some sort of compromise. Uh, I'd say that, you know, they, they they tend to come up with the lowest common, you know, <laughs> minimum lowest common minimum agreement. Uh, the way they do it, uh, which is, you know, and which has never been sufficient uh, to deal with the the scale of crisis. Um, uh, you know, I'm still hopeful that something will come out of that, which will not be, you know, um, yeah, enough. So I'll put that number to five. Five, five. All right, Colin, what's yours? Um, I'm impressed with my colleague's optimism. It's, it's four. Um, four. Because it is a huge lift and it's also a massive diplomatic effort that is required. You know, this requires 
bilateral negotiations between some of the most difficult countries to try and find out where those common areas lie. And I just don't think, you know, we've run out of time. And uh, I agree that um, the political landscape can be shaped in the elections that come up, but those governments will be new. And they yep. will not have the time to put into action the changes in direction that are desperately needed before Baku. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid I'm the pessimist in the group for. All right. All right. Good. Thank you for entertaining my uh, my, my question, everybody. Um, we've got questions from much, much, much more thoughtful questions than mine um, from those listening in. Thank you very much for those who submitted questions. I'm going to take one from Annalene Voss. Uh, thanks for joining us, Annalene, from IRC, I think, um, which is a question to Ilaria. Um, quite a specific point, says Annalene, but I was wondering how much creating a sub-target or separate category for conflict-affected countries has been discussed during the NCQG discussions. She says we saw a few mentions of these countries in the latest input paper. Um, Ilaria, what's your thoughts on that? So the short answer is no, really. Discussions have not reached the point, um, have not reached the point to talk about um, specific targets. Um, the structure, I mean, that speaks to the structure of the goal and potentially um, looking at um, special uh, recipient groups and countries. And that issue is also something that needs to be further unpacked and discussed. But I am aware that that is a proposition. It has been included in many submissions. It is in the output paper. The output paper, by the way, it is like a sort of summary of positions that the co-chairs have put together. It hasn't got any legal um, status. So it's just a summary, a compilation of views. It's not a negotiating text. So that inclusion is there and, and should, should it stay, but we haven't really discussed points about specific sub-targets or uh, specific groups, but it, it is something that many developing countries are pushing for. Um, LDCs, uh, SITs, for instance, l large groups of vulnerable countries have put together a proposal. This was an in-session submission to kind of um, reassure them of, of the uh, enhanced access for, for these countries of climate finance going forward. <clears throat> Thank you. Great. Thanks, Hilary. Um, Annalene also asked about, uh, listening to what you were saying, I think about NDCs, um, whether there's a similar needs determination report for for, for NAPs, for national action plans. Do you want to take that as well? Um, yeah, so um, other panelists might, might, might help me respond here, but my understanding is that the NDR, it looks at, it's a compilation of different national reports. So obviously it looks at assessments, uh, it makes assessments look at NDCs, but it also looks at other reports, including NAPs. So if you look at the NDR and I can put you, uh, I can put the link to it, um, you will see um, the aggregate assessment of financial needs contained in, in, in the NAPs that, that they basically also review. The figures that I mentioned were just for NDCs, but the NAPs assessment are also in the NDR and you can also find the information in the report there. I would assume that the second iteration of the NDR will uh, follow a similar methodology. So it will also consider uh, information in, in NAPs. But to my, the best of my knowledge, there isn't really a specific report that looks specifically at aggregate information um, of financial costs included in NAPs. However, you can also look at the ag adaptation gap report. I can also put the link which is a very well-cited and very uh, well-considered report as well. And it does have uh, important financial estimates for collective adaptation action. And I think it resulted in like three three 387,000 uh, billion per year. I mean, I can look at, I can basically put the link in the chat there as well for that. <clears throat> Thank you, Larry. Sandra, did you want to come on this too? Yes, yes, just to, to confirm, uh, the, the needs report, uh, is, what it does is like um, it takes all the information from the different reports, NDCs, NAPs, uh, technologic uh, assessments and different assessments to, to say what is what countries are reporting in terms of needs. But what I wanted to highlight are two things. So the first thing is that unfortunately, this number, the 5.8 trillion that is reported in the NDR based on the NDCs information, is not representative uh, of all developing countries. Why? Because not all developing countries have been able to assess the needs in terms of um, an estimation. So 
obviously is, is, um, doesn't include all developing countries. And that's why we said that it's an underestimation of the real needs. But then you have another difficulty, which is that measuring the, uh, the, the needs in adaptation is very difficult. Let's say estimated in monetary terms, how much do we need for adaptation is very difficult because adaptation is not a Take a, a change in the technology. It's not like that you change your your diesel car for an electric car and then you can quantify that change. But no, in adaptation, we are talking about processes that take time, sometimes like long term interventions, and very difficult to. And why I wanted to say this because if we if we go back to the mandate of the NCQG, for instance, that talks about um, fulfilling the needs of developing countries, and we see that most of the of the of the needs in terms of um, uh, mentioning the, the amount of, uh, of activities that are related to adaptation are higher. So for sure, all the needs, most of the needs are in adaptation, but there are not necessarily a specific estimation. Some countries are trying to do so, but it's very, very difficult to estimate. That's why one of the elements that we are pushing in, in the context of the NCQG is how can we support developing countries into do better estimations, better understanding about what is needed from the ground Around, not only at the national level, but also at the local level in communities, local actors, because otherwise we have a very, very um, fractured fractured perspective at what, what is needed at the national level. So the NDR, I, I was involved in the first one, um, it's it's a collection of information, but it's not creating any any new estimations. No Estimations, what needs to happen is support developing countries to do so, uh, those estimations at the, at the national level. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sandra. We have a question from Murad Qureshi. Thanks for the question, Murad. Uh, he says the Global North have previously reneged on their commitments when we had the Kyoto Protocol from the COPs in the late 1990s. So what is new with the climate finance uh, commitment? Um, and research undertaken by the World Bank has established that remittances and money transfer flows are a much greater and reliable flow for the Global South than official aid flows, both unilateral and multilateral. And also many in governments of the Global South will tell you that their migrants abroad are far more reliable than anyone else. So can't we see a role for migrants in climate finance uh, with say them being offered green bonds for adaptation works in their home regions and areas? So question about, a uh, broad question about, uh, about remittances, the importance of remittances there. Uh, Sunil, do you wanna take a stab at that? Sure. Yeah, <laughs> a very interesting question. First of all, yeah, I completely agree with the fact that the developed countries have been, you know, um, not upholding, you know, whatever they have said uh, in providing climate finance in the first instance. And then we've seen that, uh, you know, um, uh, finance coming from, you know, sources such as remittances, um, uh, you know, has played significant role uh, when it comes to rebuilding after disasters. Uh, and in situations of disasters. However, here we are talking about climate justice and climate finance should upheld, uh, you know, justice and equity. Uh, the remittance, um, you know, um, uh, and I often, you know, I like to cite uh, uh, this fact from uh, back in 2017 in Nepal, when, you know, Nepal suffered a very heavy flooding across the country. Uh, from international, you know, uh, development assistance and uh, you know, humanitarian assistance, the money that came was only around, um, you know, six times less than, you know, what was contributed by remittance. So people are already paying for, you know, what, what, they, uh, what they didn't create, uh, you know, this climate crisis and these disasters which are increasing. So what we are calling here for is, you know, the rich polluters to pay for, you know, what has been inflicted and then the money such as that, that comes from remittance goes for people's uh, you know own well-being they don't have to set aside their own hard earned money you know paying for the climate crisis uh, which I, I you know oddly cited is the double injustice first having to suffer without you know causing it and then paying for it again uh, you know to deal with it we, we we shouldn't allow this so we are calling for the rich polluted countries and polluting corporations and the polluting, um, you know, individuals to, uh, you know, pay for what has what damage has been done. And then again, coming to the instruments such as bonds, etc. Um, you know, we are looking for public, international public climate finance coming to the vulnerable developing countries, uh, and not in the form, you know, which are suitable for the investors to reap profits. So that, that would be my take. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Sunil. Uh, we've got a, a good question here from Hamza Abdullah, um, who says, since urban areas are increasingly becoming sites for climate risks and vulnerabilities, should the NCQG address how the mobilized finance should benefit the marginalized urban population, especially in the mega cities where a lot of inequalities exist? And should this be included in the conversation around the quality of finance uh, as well as the quantity, I guess? Colin, what do you think on that one? Okay, uh, great question, Hamza. Um, yeah, I mean, urban urban issues are becoming more apparent in the climate space, um, and I think the issue of heat is one that is 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 a particular challenge that has been prevalent prevalent present for a few years, but has really become prevalent in the last couple of years. We've seen heat, you know, fifty odd degrees in South Asian cities, uh, and this has an impact not only on 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 people's health. I, you know, the extreme heat causes, uh, exacerbates existing health, uh, underlying health conditions, particularly for the el elderly, the disabled. But it's also preventing a lot of these informal workers from being able to work because the temperature during the day is so high that they're unable to pull their rickshaw or go into the fields and do the work that they were traditionally doing. So yeah, th so this is a growing problem, and I think it's it's just a good example of of um, our failure to tackle the the, the climate emergency. Uh, and as, as Sunil just mentioned, you know, this is a climate justice issue, uh, and we need to we need to think of it in that climate justice framing. Uh, I think the other important thing to bear in mind is, you know, the discussion so far has talked about the big picture quantum. It hasn't talked about then how that money is going to be used, how that's going to be mobilised. Uh, and I think that's you know that's an issue that um, we also need to be thinking about. But it's not the focus of the negotiations. The negotiations is to secure the capital, to secure the resourcing. It's then up to countries to develop the appropriate mechanisms whereby that funding then meets the needs of the climate vulnerable communities. Uh, and so you know I think the first principle is we need to be thinking about encouraging countries to take on holistic assessments to identify where their priorities lie. And if urban heat is a particular challenge then that needs to be in their nationally determined contribution. It needs to be in their national adaptation plan. It needs to be in their strategies and plans to tackle a climate emergency. However, we know that there are going to be communities, locations, um, members of, of, of communities or, or people work, you know, people living in maybe fragile um, uh, countries where governance is, is, is limited that are not going to be able to access it through a, through a country level process. So I think having a direct access stream, particularly for adaptation, loss and damage, is also a, a requirement of, of the NCQG going forward. We need to have direct access to enable those communities who are on the front lines, who are facing the brunt of the climate emergency, to be able to access those funds. And the lessons learned from the Green Climate Fund is you can over-engineer a fund, you can over-engineer the requirements of, of um, uh, accreditation to access the funds to a degree that actually inhibits access for frontline organizations, CBOs, indigenous peoples organizations, etc., to be able to ask those questions, uh, access those funds. And then I think the final point is, yes, we need to respect local and indigenous knowledge around the climate emergency. I think a lot of the solutions, we, are, we already know what the solutions are. Uh, we know what the challenge, we know what the problem is. The, 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 the biggest issue is the political will to actually deliver on this. And if urban, urban uh, resilience or urban um, climate emergency is going to be the thing that tips the balance, then um, sadly that is going to be the, the future. And maybe that's, uh, that's where the, the political arguments can really come to the fore because you've got a, a quite a, a, a focused political governance system that you can target. But no, great question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Great answer. Thank you, Colin. Uh, we have a question from Martha Bacaley, who I should say for the full disclosure is an esteemed colleague of mine at Development Initiatives, um, who says it seems the common and common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities, so CBDRRC principle, is no more at the heart of negotiations as we witnessed in Bonn this month. What are your advocacy plans for bringing this back to the centre of discussions? in the determination of NCQG to ensure net transfer from developed to particularly low income developing countries. And she also makes the point uh, and asks the question about, as panel members have said, there's no quantum proposed by developed countries while developing countries have come up with a number. Um, the lessons from the 100 billion target, she says, showed that having a quantum is not good enough. 
And in the submissions from the panel members, she says, you've highlighted quality and impact equally important as well. What are the next steps to put pressure in the other elements as well as the quantum? So sort of a, a couple of dimensions to that question. Uh, Sandra, I know we're going to have to let you go shortly to jump on to something else. And thank you for being with us. Uh, let me let you uh, have a crack at, the, at any part of that question you'd like to take. Absolutely, Royal. First, thank you so much. I think this is this is uh, the the um, a very very important question. So the very first thing is that definitely we have to uh, why the NCQG as a process has been very different from the hundred billion because we have been it is important to mention we have been two for discussing this for two and a half years already. So the NCQG is not something that is 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 now created uh, from from nowhere. No, we have been discussing for two one for uh, for two two five. 0.5 years like what is this NCQG? why has to be different what elements needs to be part of this discussion but definitely the biggest frustration and 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 is related to to this debate about where is the NCQG sitting is in the article 9 in the article 21c and this is precisely the biggest frustration because as 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 Marta was mentioning the CBDR the common but the differentiated responsibilities is part fundamental part of the convention fundamental part of the of the agreement and now in the context of the ncqg we are turning the discussion about um the contributor base like who else has to pay obviously we know that uh, developed countries want to see countries such as china uh, the the arab group and, and others that are more like uh, emerging in terms of economy they want to see them not only providing but reporting and i think for for developed countries it's a matter of transparency as well like how much is china actually contributing in terms of climate finance because it's true that china is providing a lot of resources but there is there is not a report let's say as such so this this conversation is a lot about yeah provision underlying but mainly transparency but that's why i do believe uh, and 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 i just want to highlight one of the frustration is that it's not only about the the opening the 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 contributor base we know that it's going to be very difficult just to open the door for one country once you open the door the door then everyone uh, will be on the spot no and this is precisely what developing countries don't want because it's like if we are talking about the ncqg in the context of article 9 our provisions from develop to developing countries. We cannot inv invite the private sector in this part because it's not part of the Article 9. No? And that's why we have these other, other elements. So I, I do believe that in the context of the NCQG, we have to continue pushing for the core goal that has to be public, has to be from developed to developing countries, or at least public, uh, public interventions from developed countries. And, and we have to really, really embrace these needs uh, in, in providing more concessional and grants space it obviously will come other other elements but we have to defend uh, somehow in the developing world um these elements related to adaptation include loss and damage it's important to mention that developed countries don't want to see loss and damage as one of the goals of one part of, of the ncqg uh, and 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 keep putting pressure no in in g7 in the countries in the g7 to really allocate and commit uh, the the un and um, the u the assembly in new york will be also important like to keep put, putting pressure and to encourage developed countries to bring with numbers because the the huge risk and it's very likely to happen but the huge risk is that if we don't have important agreements we will end up with 100 billion again no because the the mandate says with 100 billion as a floor so if developed countries want to be difficult they will leave it in the 100 um, and and this is a, a perfect worst case scenario so i would encourage like to continue the, the conversations politically speaking we need to put pressure on 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 developing of developed countries because developing countries obviously a uh, need also to to defend the 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 side in the context of article 9 but we will see what what happens the next the next step uh, the next technical discussion is in uh, in in baku before the cop uh, so this will be also very very critical to to sense the 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 the, the yeah the, the environment in and hopefully we will get if not the most ambitious goal because i think it's very difficult at least one that really really responds to to those needs Thank you, Adrian, and thanks everyone for the invitation. Thank you very much, Sandra. Great comments, and we'll let you go, but we're going to continue for another 10 minutes uh, with the rest of the 
panel. Uh, we've got a, a, a good question here from Jonathan Bainan, who I think is at CGD. Thanks for joining, Jonathan. Focusing on credibility, he says, how far will the ETF uh, take us, the Enhanced Transparency Framework, in allowing consistent reporting and like-for-like -like comparison of donor climate finance? Um, Ewan, why don't you come back in on this one first? Yeah, thanks. I think it's a great question. Uh, I, I think... I guess a short answer is is not far enough would, would be my view and and i'd be interested to hear what, what other, other panelists think as well i think that's for a couple of reasons first because of of uh you know i i i'd argue there are some things missing from from what it requires um uh, and you know I, I, again anyone please correct me if i'm wrong but i don't think it requires um you, you know a, actual tracking of disbursements against commitments you know there's still that choice to pick commitments or disbursements whereas uh you, you know obviously we care about um, about both. Um, in the section uh, of the modalities, procedures, guidelines, and so on, it doesn't mention any uh, requirement for uh, providers to to say anything about impact, either, either you know, ex ante or ex post. Um, and I think, uh, you know, as mentioned, I think that's something that um, would be really helpful. And then also on grant equivalents, I, I, I think there's, there's a sort of an option to, you know, an optional column to put the... Um, uh, the, the the grant equivalent of loans, but you, you know, I, it, it, I as as we've heard from many panelists, I mean that's a really essential question, especially when comparing across across providers, and and it you know it seems odd that it should be um, uh, an, an optional uh, requirement, but also there isn't anything on. And one thing that I think is really interesting in this in this you know conversation about concessionality is that. Uh, you know, I think there could potentially be uh, use in having a discussion about what that actually means, because, you know, the way that people usually refer to concessionality is um, the way the, the, the DAC measure, measures it at the OECD, and that's very controversial. Uh, you know, that was a very political decision arrived at by, you know, a small selection of rich countries uh, that, that many, um, you know, outside analysts have been very critical of, and I think... Um, you know, I, I I think that it's worth uh, re reflecting on um, whether that's the right thing. I, I think I'd also say as well that transparency is the first step. You know, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition. We it, it's great that we know about all of the, the 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 disparities in reporting among countries that exist, but there has to then be some 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 way of uh, you know some method of, of accountability um, uh, to you know kind of point out these differences. Um, preferably within the UNFCCC, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and, and let. Yeah, Laurie, would you like to come in on that? Yes, yeah, so I can. I agree with Owen, but I can also share what the, what has been said in the negotiations on this issue. Um, if there is one thing that everyone agrees on, frankly, is that uh, transparency needs to be better this time around. And there is already the ETF, the Enhanced Transparency Framework, which has been agreed already to track implementation of the Paris Agreement. So nobody really has the appetite to negotiate a dedicated ad hoc transparency system for the NCQG. They just want to use the ETF adapt it, complement it as need be, but use it really as the main transparency vehicle to track and monitor NCQG implementation going forward. Couple of caveats though. First, as Owen said, reporting and grant equivalent is voluntary. <laughs> and we know how important that is, but it is voluntary. And uh, the ETF has been agreed in Katowice, that was a few years ago, and it won't be reviewed until 2028. It can't be reviewed this year, it can't be reviewed next year, it won't be done until 2028. So any modification needed to accommodate NCQG reporting and tracking will have to wait until 2028. That's the, NC, that's the ETF. And um, one thing to mention as well is that as part of the reporting under the ETF, you have reporting parameters. You also have reporting tables where you include values and you also have um, a qualitative section so basically a section where you provide narrative information about um, elements that would be useful things like um, you know how how do you understand progression beyond previous efforts the climate specificity of your contribution so developed countries provider countries will have to explain in a narrative way this kind of information the ETF does not tell you this is climate finance definitions for everyone, but at least ask you to provide more information about your understanding and your methodolic, methodological approach 
to report on your climate finance and what for you is beyond previous efforts, so new and additional climate specificity and so on. So it will give us more information and it is definitely a step forward in the right direction, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. We're almost out of time. Time for one more question. There's one here from uh, Richard Eubank. Um, with climate finance running at about 1% of the public expenditure on fossil fuel subsidies, IMF estimate $7 trillion, and industrial agricultural subsidies, World Bank estimate $700 billion, both of those driving climate and environmental collapse, what psychological changes need to occur in the heads of policymakers to reverse this situation? Uh, I don't know if any of our panel consider themselves... Uh, amateur or professional psychologists, certainly professionals in all sorts of other aspects of science, possibly not that one, but have a crack at that as we wrap up, because I think that, um, thank you, Richard, for the question. And it sort of captures the the sense of uh, both uh, action needed and frustration at progress so far, doesn't it? And, and the need for progress to be made crucially in these next few months uh, around both the, the quantum and the quality questions around climate finance that we've been discussing here. So what psychological changes need to occur in the heads of policymakers? I have to keep you ve all very brief. So this will have to be an impressively succinct um, answer to the question. Sunil, why don't you go first? So, um, yeah, as you say, not a psychological expert, but uh, what I'd say is like, you know, it's all about the political will because it's not about the lack of resources it's not about lack of money but it's about the priorities uh, we've seen that uh, you know the developed countries who have the most resources who have the most historical responsibilities are being able to you know um, provide money uh, it's uh, the question mentioned on fossil fuel subsidies uh, you know the subsidies for uh, agricultural input, uh, inputs which are you know detrimental to the environment uh, you know of financing wars and military expenditures, but they have not been able to you know, provide money that is required for climate action. That is primarily because the political capture um, by the rich you know, corporates and rich individuals. So we need to you know, fight to change that. We need to you know, and work with the government or demand the governments to uh, you know, tax these filthy rich Corporate, corporates and individuals so that we have enough money for climate action. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. Uh, very clear. Ewan, what do you think? Um, yeah, I'm really sorry. If you could just, if you just repeat the question, I think I missed a little bit of that. So I'll 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 throw it to Alari and ask and give you a chance to <laughs> have think about it. But the question was with was essentially what psychological changes need to occur in the heads of policymakers to reverse this situation where far more funds are being found for fossil fuel subsidies and industrial agriculture subsidies than for climate finance. Ilari, what do you think? Well, climate change is felt everywhere, right? It's no it's not exclusive to a particular set of countries or countries. It's flank it frankly felt everywhere. And we we, we can all feel it. The, 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 the planet is getting hotter, period. So unless we really tackle this in terms of controlling emissions, um, you know, more climate finance will be needed. I mean, the needs will only escalate because more finance will be needed for adaptation and to address loss and damage. So yeah, we, we, we need to worry about funding now, but we also need to worry about capping emissions so that the problem of finance doesn't become worse because at this point, at this rate, it will become worse. Um, and I cannot agree more with all my fellow panelists. Access, again, is an issue that everyone seems to agree on and we really need to echo this strongly. It doesn't matter how big the uh, the NCQG is, how ambitious in number, it matters very little if it doesn't reach the people that need it the most. So access, enhanced access, reaching the poorest communities, the most vulnerable countries needs to be a priority uh, this year. And that is something that I echo um, a lot. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Larry. Very short uh, answer from Ewan, and then I'll go to Colin to wrap us up, Ewan. Yeah, that's really... Um, it's re I thought about it and still think it's a really difficult question. I mean, I note that in the UK, I mean, uh, there's a really fascinating graph um, that, that shows the sort of planned and then actual uh, changes to um, taxes on road fuels. You know, every year uh, the government, you know, says that we're going to have to increase fuel duty because, the, you know, the externalities and so on. And every year there's a massive political backlash and it doesn't happen. And so I, I think, yeah, yeah. Um, 
you know, managing to to make make the case that it's important um, and um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, no no sort of quick easy answers. Yeah, maybe 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 Colin will say something more optimistic. But um, I, I mean, one thing I, that, that that I did that, that I did know is that you know, there's certainly evidence in in the UK that there's kind of you know, politicians are, um, you know, very cautious about talking too much about climate because they don't think the electorate wants it. And the electorate think that politicians don't want it because they never talk about it. And so there's sort of some sort of coordination problem there. And, and, if, and, and um, you know, that seems like it could be solvable. But yeah, difficult question. Thank you, Ewan. Colin? Uh, I'm all for polluter praise approaches, um, you know, practical action. We were founded by Fritz Schumacher, who wrote the book, Small is Beautiful, Economics of the People Mattered. You know, I think that's the shift that we need. Um, and we know that if we were just to say tax fossil fuel extraction, we could generate up to 720 billion a year by the end of the decade. Uh, and that's, you know, that's going a long way to meeting the needs. It's not it's not going to meet the whole needs, but it is going to go a long way to meeting the needs. And, it, and I think the important thing is going to provide that pressure to then stop the extraction industry from just this rampant uh, process that we're going through. You know, we've got enough fossil fuel resources to um to, to roast the planet three or four times over if we if we dig it all out the ground and burn it so um yeah we need that we need that political will as of said thank you thank you very much look we are over time uh, we'll have to wrap it up there thank you very much to all those who put in questions we had more than enough in fact uh, uh, certainly more than enough questions to to take us through and beyond the allotted time, uh, but we'll need to leave it there. Uh, Ewan has uh, let us know that he is, uh, and I'm aware of this, in our development initiatives office in Bristol, we have a problem with the air conditioning, so he's hitting about 200 degrees and is about to uh, <laughs> hope, hopefully not fall over, but perspiring visibly. Um, Sunil, Ilari, Colin, uh, and uh, and and Sandra too in her absence now, thank you so much for joining us, and to you as well, Ewan, of course. And to Tim Molyneux and our team, Fiona Smith and, and the rest of the team who put this together at uh, Development Initiatives. Many thanks to all of you um, and to everyone who's joined this conversation. Uh, we appreciate it. There's a lot to be taken forward from these, these, uh, these important topics, which I'm not going to begin to try to summarize. Uh, but what we do know is that both on quantity and on quality, there are real questions to be answered and progress to be made over these next few weeks and months. And perhaps, perhaps we can move our optimism up from the four end of, out of 10 towards the seven, at least uh, over the next few weeks and months. But that depends on that political will uh, uh, that has been talked about. So thank you all uh, to our panel, to the audience. Thank you very much. And we'll leave it there for now. Have Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, all. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.